the book of Matthew, chapter 2. And uh, we'll look in the Word of God. The book of Matthew, chapter 2, that famous passage of Scripture there about the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, we'll read it this morning. Matthew, chapter 2. And I feel a little warm here, y'all. A little warm. We'll try to get some air moved. It's 20 degrees. We'll come in this morning. And now it's 75. And we had to go from heat to air. So uh, we've got... Uh, 398 degree pokers in this building. And that heats up a place. Um, Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2 this morning. Up on this one, Brother Mike. Verse number 1. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him in Bethlehem, Judea, For thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. Y'all going to have to help me now. Everybody be real quiet. Quiet and still, kids. Everybody. Verse 8. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also. I want to preach this morning uh, on the subject. I've never used it just like this before. But I want to preach this morning on the subject, the birth that changed the world. The birth that changed the world. There have been, since Adam and Eve first had their first Youngins, that there in the, uh, in the early days of the book of Genesis, over six billion people born on this earth. There's, that's a low estimate because there's six billion alive right now. But probably, maybe close to seven billion. There wasn't that many till the last hundred years. But at least, probably in the neighborhood of seven billion people born on this earth. You know what I mean? A billion is? A billion is a thousand million. For a man to have a million dollars, if he have two million dollars, three million dollars, he'd have to have a thousand million dollars to have a billion dollars. Sometimes you don't think there's much difference between a millionaire and a billionaire, but there's a major difference. There's much difference between a millionaire and a billionaire is as a thousand air and a millionaire. And so there was seven billion people born on this earth. There's only been one that's had the effect on it that Jesus Christ has had. Now we're going to look at that this morning. The birth that changed the world. Hallelujah. I, I remember reading a story one time. I said one time I was having a feud up there in West Virginia somewhere. How they used to fight and feud in the Hatfields and McCoys. And there's a family fighting and they're shooting at each other. And they're shooting across the streets at each other. And about that time one of the babies got out of the house and a little baby went crawling across uh, the driveway and out in the road. And when they seen that baby out there on the side of the road, both of them thought, cease fire! Stop! The baby coming out! And buddy, every one of them laid down their guns and quit shooting. And the little baby crawled out and made peace. I got thinking about that one day. This old world was in bad shape. This old world was not rocking and reeling from wars and everything. The little baby crawled out one day out of Bethlehem's manger. And there, he came and said, let there be peace on this earth. Now, I want to say a few things about the birth that changed the world. I hope you'll listen to me a few minutes this morning. I've, I've, I've got something to say if you'll listen to me. And if you'll listen to me this morning, I believe it'll be a blessing to you. We don't ever have to be ashamed of saying, I belong to Jesus. I love Jesus. I know Jesus. You kids at school, you go to school, don't you ever be ashamed tell them at school that you love Jesus Christ. I mean, it doesn't matter if these nuts come in and uh, against the nativity scene and against uh, 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 that. Just ignore people like that. And you don't have to be ashamed of saying, I know the Lord. I want to say three things about it this morning. We'll go. 
First of all, I want to look at the time of this birth. The time of this birth. Old Jesus Christ superstar rock opera, that old wicked, blasphemous piece of trash that to come out back in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, uh, questioned the time. You know, one of those said, Jesus Christ, superstar, who are you? What did you sacrifice? And they said, why did you come at such a backward time? Or it's backward place in such a, a weird time. I'm going to tell you something this morning. He came to this earth right on time. He showed up right when he's supposed to right, show up. Them people didn't know the Bible's their problem. Let me give you some quotes from the Old Testament. In Genesis 49 and verse 10, the Bible said that the Messiah would come when the scepter departs from Israel. Now, most people don't know the Bible good enough to even understand that. But the Bible said in Genesis 49 that the Messiah would come. 4,000 years before He come, by the way. said, come when the scepter departs from Israel. Now, the scepter was like a, a rod that the king held when the king run, ruled over the world. And this king ruled over the world, and he held out his scepter. And every one of those kings was Jewish, 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 Israelites. And the Lord said in Genesis 49, 10, He said, when the scepter departs from Israel, the Messiah would come. Now, I just read to you a while ago, it said there was in the days of Herod the king. Do you realize this morning that Herod was the first Gentile king to rule over the Jews? All of them have been Jewish all the way back. And then Herod the king shows up. The scepter had departed from Israel. The first non Herod on the throne. Yes, sir, brother. God knew what He was doing. And He said in Galatians 4 and verse 4, He said, When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, boy made of a woman, born in likeness of our flesh. And that's why that we call it, before Jesus comes, we call it B.C., before Christ. We call it after the Lord comes, A.D. That means Anno Domini, or the year of our Lord. And that's what that word means, A.D. So history dates itself before He came and after He came. I'm, I'm smiling because I think, Lord have mercy. He is so far ahead, a little redneck with saviors like Buddha, Muhammad. I mean, you're a Muslim here this morning. I love you and God loves you. But your religion is dead as a, as a fish. Somebody caught her three years ago. I'm telling you that it ain't worth having. I mean, you're, if you're a Buddhist here this morning, it ain't worth a big old hoot. Amen. I'm glad this morning, brother, we've got somebody. They changed history and the calendar changed the year He showed up. Before He come, they call it B.C. After He come, they call it A.D. or the year of our Lord. Amen. Ever asked, I, I love it. Old, old Howard Stern, every time he signs a check uh, that he makes off perverting people, he signs it the year of our Lord, 2006. Every time old Madeline Mary uh, got her taxes back, it said the year of our Lord, whatever year it was. Every time one old atheist, did you hear about that atheist this week? That's, uh, I listened to uh, ACLJ, that America's uh, lawyer, old Jay Seculo. I don't know if y'all listen to him. He's a smart dude. Y'all listen to it. Learn, way to get smarter is listen to people than you are. And that's why some of y'all get dumber a lot because at school you listen to people dumber than you are. If you don't, you don't get smart, listen to somebody smarter than you are. And you know what? Old Jay Seculo said there's this guy in there the other day and he was complaining because all over the all over the country, people vote in churches. You know, we had an election here a few weeks ago. And it's been a common practice for hundreds of years. Churches are local. Everybody knows where they are. Uh, they're easily accessible. Have a nice car parking lot. They don't have a business going during the week. So it just makes sense. There's nothing wrong with people going into a vote. And one guy was protesting because he said he was an atheist. And he said, I well, think it's wrong. That's against my rights that I have to walk into a church and vote. He said, I had to walk right by a cross. 
And he was upset. Did y'all hear about that? I mean, they're planning on suing, going to the Supreme Court and saying, we cannot go. I cannot walk by a cross. I just cannot walk by a cross. Well, if you are an atheist, duh. I mean, if you're an atheist, you don't But there's a God, right? What harm is a cross going to do? If there ain't nothing to it, what you so upset about, boy? What's your problem, big boy? I tell you something. They don't mind walking by a Jewish synagogue. Don't mind going to Nuremberg. There's just something about that cross, man. Hey, I wonder if that, I wonder if that hypocrite protests Madonna wearing one around her neck. Wonder if, he, wonder if he stands in MTV and says, Don't let Madonna wear a cross. I bet he likes hers. Amen. Everybody sound now. Don't nobody else get up. Now, if somebody besides you get up, grab them by their leg. <laughs> All right, we can't get up. You cannot get up, kids. Sit down. I'm going to tell you something, brother. They held right in there and said, I'm offended. Madonna's got a cross. 50 Cent wears a cross. It's awful. Or, or Tupac wore a cross. Everybody wears a cross. I mean, you'll never hear him say about that. But man, when he had to walk in that church, it bothered him. I'm telling you, there's just something special about Jesus. There's something special about Him, brother. Amen. Somebody said this. Jesus, blessed Jesus. Don't you know Him? Isn't it great to be a Christian? Poets have written their sweetest odes to Him. Singers have sung their greatest songs in an effort to express out of the human heart what this announcement meant. Painters have spent a lifetime producing the greatest masterpieces as an expression of what He has meant to the human heart and life. Prophets and the writers of the Old and New Testament have exhausted the human language trying to tell what they felt. Isaiah, the great prophet of all the prophets, after exhausting the entire vocabulary and finding no speech speech in which to describe the Savior, said His name shall be called Wonderful. He's the Balm of Gilead. He's the Rose of Sharon. He's the Lily of the Valley. He's the altogether lovely one, brother. Her Apostle Paul exhausted the Greek language, telling us what he felt in his heart. And he closed and said, Thanks be unto God for His unspeakable gift. Thou shalt call His name Jesus, for He shall save His people from His sin. I'm glad this morning the old story it never grows old. Hallelujah. Brother, it's the time of this birth. Amen. I want to say the timing was right. I want to say number two this morning, the place of the birth. The place of His birth. Have you ever done any studying and you stuck out by Him? It was people say, oh, well, how sweet. There's a little manger scene. There was a lot more than that over in the book of Micah. I just read it the other day. I'm finishing up my Old Testament for this year. And I read in the book of Micah how the, the, the Bible said in Micah chapter number 2. Let me give you the prophecy. Micah chapter 2, 700 years. 700 years. Before it ever took place. Listen to me, kids. Look out here. Everybody look at me. Listen, watch me the whole time. Micah chapter number 2. And the Bible said, in Micah chapter number 2, you know what he said? He said, O Bethlehem, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come he that is to rule my people Israel. Now, I don't know if you understand that. Let me see if I can explain that just a little bit better. The Messiah had to have somewhere to be born. He had to be born somewhere. So, uh, in the known world of that time, uh, in, in those days, the ancient world had uh, three, three countries, or three, uh, uh, three continents. Europe, Asia, and Africa. That was inhabited at that time. Out of those, of course, Asia was chosen. But Asia has many countries. Palestine was chosen out of all those. Palestine has three districts, Judea, Galilee, and Samaria. Judea was nailed down. Judea had many villages, and one of them was Bethlehem, and it was chosen. So out of thousands of cities, the prophet Micah said he'll be born in Bethlehem 700 years before it happened. That would be like you putting a map on the United States uh, uh, across that, uh, that wall. And there's thousands and thousands of cities. Don't trip me while I'm preaching. And, uh, and they, uh, they, uh, uh, had all that. So I used to do basketball. Uh, you know, somebody come down the court, I'd do like that. You know, our court was so little. But anyway, what if, what if you had a map of the United States up there? Thousands of cities. And I took like this and I took a dart. 
And I practiced up on my darts the other day down in Florida. The room I sat in had a dartboard, and I throwed different things all week. Never did get a bullseye. Uh, I got closer and closer, never could get the bullseye. But what if I took a dart like this, and there's 10,000 cities of the United States there, and I slung it backwards and hit Morgan. And then I said, he said, just like I took another and done it 20 times in a row. You said, that's impossible. You're right. That would never happen. Nobody could do that. And yet that prophet, 700 years, nailed it, brother. Like them, you ever seen on the news, they got these satellites, and it'll show like a city where a crime's committed, and it just goes down, 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 and you see the buildings, and you see the grass, and people's house, and it gets closer and closer, right in somebody's backyard. That's the way them, prof- them prophets had a satellite, brother, that could beat them in outer space all to pieces. I mean, God saw it ahead of time, and He nailed down uh, uh, Bethlehem. He was born in Bethlehem. The prophet spoke of the place. Now listen, bro, you, you run out of your, your money out of your bank account after a while. That cannot be an accident. That cannot be luck. Listen to me, boys. That cannot be luck. Nobody's that lucky. I know people that they, all they see is parts in the Bible. Well, I don't believe this. And what about that? How come this? How come that? If there's a God, why not? Some people are natural pessimists. Other people are natural optimists. We got people that just... You ever know these people, they see the bad side of everything, and then some people see the good side of everything. That's a bad way to be. It's just looking at bad. They, they see bad things and everything. They see bad in this, bad in that. Always try to see the good. Heard about this fella. It was Christmas time, and he had, um, he had two boys. And he told somebody, he said, Now, boy, he said, my two boys, he said, one of them is an optimist, one of them is a pessimist. He said, it's Christmas time. He said, I guarantee you, no matter what I get one of them, he ain't going to like it. And no matter what I get the other one, he will like it. He said, really? He said, that's right. He said, I'll prove it to you. So Christmas time comes. He said, that one boy, he complains about everything. He said, that other boy, he'll find something good to say about anything. Well, it come Christmas morning, and they opened the presents. And that one that was a pessimist, he, uh, he, he boxed up an electric train. And the daddy had that electric train in that box, and he had it all in there, boxed up for him. And the one who was a pe- uh, an optimist, he went out in the, pe- in the pasture and dug up some horse manure. And he put this horse manure in a box and wrapped it up and set it under the tree. They said, man, you're, you're fixing to call World War III. And boy, both boys got up Christmas morning and opened up a present. And one of them grabbed that train and started putting it together. And boy, he was excited and all that. And he started putting that thing together. The other boy just went out in the yard uh, running around with a, a smile on his face with his present. And boy, I'll tell you what, they couldn't figure out what was... And that, that little boy sat there and said, this train's not big enough. It won't work. Some of the pictures ain't here. It don't don't feel right. I saw a better one at Sears. I, uh, he found everything in the world along with that train. They went out to that other little boy. They said, what'd you get? He said, I got a pony around here somewhere if I can find it. Now, I'm going to tell you what, brother. You know what he's doing? He's saying, I'm looking at the best side of things. Amen. I'm telling you, that's the way we ought to do about God and the church and the Lord and the Bible. This is tis the season to be jolly, brother. We ought to be happy. Amen. Deck the hall with bells of holly. Follow la la la. Shout the victory. The Lord's coming. Hallelujah. Glory to the newborn king. Amen. Place of this birth. You know what they brought him, them dudes brought him? When Jesus was there, the Bible said they come and they brought him gold and frankincense and myrrh. Did you know, a lot of people just sing that little song and they think how funny that is. But, it's, uh, but I tell you, there's some meaning in that. Gold in the Bible represents a king. Uh, uh, frankincense in the Bible represents a priest offering up incense. That's our prayer. Going up to God, intercessory. And, and myrrh represents the prophets. A prophet that has a bitter light. Myrrh is mine, it's bitter perfume. Brings the light of gathering gloom, sorrow and pleading, bleeding, dying, steel in the stone cold tomb. You know the song said. And brother, I'm telling you, you know what those three things represented? That what they didn't bring him brass. They didn't bring him, they didn't bring him country style steak or watermelon. They brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. You know what gold represented? His kingship. You know what frankincense represented? It represented his priestly rights of the high priest. And the myrrh represented the bitterness of the cross 
that he would suffer. Myrrh, brother, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. I'm going to tell you the way it went. It went like this. Myrrh, he suffered and bled and died as a prophet. Frankincense, he's right now at the right hand of God, making intercession for us as a high priest. And gold, one day he's coming back as King of kings and Lord of lords. Hallelujah, brother. That's why they brought him those gifts at his birth. Amen. The place of this birth. I'm talking about the birth that changed the world. Amen. I'm telling you, brother, nobody else dates a calendar from their birth. Number three, this, scene, or this morning I'll be through, is the reason for this birth. The reason for this birth. My, my, my. Why was He born? Why did He come? Did He come just because, you know, we have it, we have it in, our, in our head that uh, when Jesus came to this earth, that was like these sweet little stable and it was these little donkeys smiled and they had baby powder on them and they smelled good. Not that way at all. Not that way at all. It was a cold time of year. There was Mary and Joseph out there, the Virgin Mary. His mother was a virgin. Never been with a man intimately until after Jesus was born. And here's the Lord Jesus Christ. There were cattle and all that stuff like the songs say. The sweet baby wakes, but little Lord Jesus, no crying He makes. And, and I, I don't know about that. He probably cried. Uh, he was human. Uh, but I'm going to tell you something, brother. There was something different about that. the reason for that birth. That birth changed the world. There was no room for him in the end. People, do you realize all this stuff I'm saying? I mean, think about it. Why did the Holy Spirit put that in there? Why does stuff like that happen? Do you all ever think about there was no room for them? Think about that. Now, if anybody else had been writing the Bible... They said, well, they went and got them a room, you know, and, and everybody was there. And the angels cried around and said, hallelujah. But it said there was no room for them in the end. Typical of how it would be throughout history. People today still have no room for Him. You know, the average person out here today, here's the average Christmas shop. It's Christmas shopping, you know. People lined up outside of Walmart. Four o'clock in the morning, right like that, you know, you drop my parking lot, bust you in the face, uh, you know, all that, you know, and here the Walmart doors open, and all the employees are in there, and they open it up like that, and the guy comes on and says, let's get ready to rumble, you know, I, I'm telling you, that's Christmas nowadays, amen, I bust you in the mouth, happy birthday, Jesus, you know, like that, I'm telling you, brother, they still have no room for him, most people this morning still have no room for him, I'm telling you, all that stuff's in the Bible. Bible, brother. It's all in the Bible. If uh, Listen, I believe the Bible because of stuff like that. It's that, That's too coincidental. It cannot be an accident that there was no room for them in the end. That He showed up at Bethlehem. That His mother was a virgin. He made His grave with the wicked. He never sinned. Never said a word He shouldn't say. Never took a step He shouldn't take. Never went to a place He shouldn't go. Never had an attitude He shouldn't have. Perfect and sinful. His whole life, He'll save your soul this morning if you'll trust Him. This morning, He'll save you if you'll trust Him. I'm telling you, brother, I'm telling you, I wish I could tell it better. Hallelujah, brother, the reason for this birth. His, he wasn't born to show us a better way. He was born to save us from Satan's power. That's what that song says. To save us all from Satan's power. When we were gone astray, oh, tidings of comfort and joy. Oh, tidings he told he. He was born to save us from Satan's power. You know how long Socrates philosophized? Forty years. You know how long Plato was here? Fifty. You know how long Aristotle was here? All these are Greek philosophers? Forty. You know how long Jesus taught? Three and a half. And they got every smart thing they ever learned from him. Like that one old country preacher said, he said, I don't pay no attention to them old Greek philosophers, old Plato, Aristotle, and Socrates. He said, I don't, he said, they don't make no sense. Uh, but I'm going to tell you something, brother, this morning. The reason for this birth, it's changed lives. You know why Jesus was born? He was born quite simply to save our soul from Satan's power. To keep us out of hell. Now think about it like this. Uh, let's say you're on your way to prison, you know. You know, we've been seeing with the kids. Police got me now. Police got me now. Uh, we've been saying, I'm going to miss you when I'm in prison. I'm, you know, uh, uh, listen, we've been saying that with the kids lately. That's awful, ain't it? 
That's awful. We wrote some of that. Somebody else going to this. But uh, listen, brother, if I was on my way to get... Police got me now. Police got me now. Now, I'm telling you, brother, there's a lot of them going this morning. And a lot of them going this morning. Amen? And I'm telling you what, brother. Listen, I'd hate to be on my way to prison. I would, brother. I preached in jails. I visited people in jail. I'd hate to be on my way to prison. But, brother, it's like we was on our way to that terrible prison, the lake of fire. And hell before that. People stay in hell till judgment day. Then they come out and go into the lake of fire. Hence the old country saying, out of the frying pan, into the fire. And brother, somebody come down and interposed his precious blood to keep my soul out of the lake of fire. When I die. Woo! Hallelujah to God, brother. The reason for his birth, he come to rescue my soul from hell. Now, everybody in this room this morning is on your way to hell or heaven right now. You want know me to tell you the difference? Let me tell you the difference. In heaven, I wrote these down, people's always happy. In hell, you're always miserable. In heaven, you love everybody. In hell, you hate everybody. In heaven, you see beautiful things. In hell, it's complete darkness. In heaven, there's peace. In hell, there's war. In heaven, there's goodness. In hell, there's evil. In he heaven, there's angels. In hell, there's demons. In heaven, there's Jesus. In hell, there's Satan. In heaven, the weather's perfect. In hell, you burn forever. In heaven, you'll eat perfect food. In hell, you'll gnash on people with your teeth. In heaven, you're comforted. In hell, you're tormented. In heaven, there's joy. In hell, there's sorrow. In heaven, there's smiles. In hell there's frown. In heaven there's praise. In hell there's screams. In heaven there's pleasure. In hell there's pain. In heaven there's understanding. In hell there's confusion. In heaven there's rivers of life. In hell there's no war at all. In heaven there's clean air. In, in hell there's smoke and blackness and fire and smoke. In heaven there's no need of the sun. In, in uh, hell there's fire and brimstone. In heaven there's love. In hell there's hate. In heaven you live forever. In hell you'll burn forever and wish you'd have never been born. That's why one of them's called heaven and the other's called hell. And Jesus was born on, in Bethlehem's manger to save your soul from hell. That's why. That's the whole reason for it. Amen. John 3.16 said, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, there's two places where everybody believes what I'm preaching this morning. One's heaven, and the other's hell. There ain't no atheists in hell. There are no atheists in heaven or hell. The only atheists are people down here that want to live like the devil and want an excuse to it so they convince themselves ain't no God so their conscience won't bother. Now, I'm telling you this morning, how if there ain't no God, how do we even get here? Where did everything come from? There is a God. And the reason for this birth was to save our soul from hellfire. I read about people in this world that's changed. That changed me. I preached on it a couple of Sunday nights ago. I could never have changed. You say, well, Brother Danny, you ain't much now. Yeah, you should have known me before the Lord got a hold of me. Be patient. He ain't through with me yet. He's working on me, buddy. He's doing something with me. And one of these days... He'll set up a little trophy up there and somebody's going to say, Who's that? Oh, that's little Danny Castle. You're kidding me. How'd he make it? I, well, I saved him when he's 18. Made him a trophy of grace. That's why, listen, I am dependent. I am dependent on that baby that was born in that manger to take my soul to heaven. Hey, man, bless God. Hallelujah. I've got a ticket and I'm just as good as if I was already there. Woo! I ought to just stop and shout a while this morning. You know how sure I'm not going to heaven? As sure as what that Bible says. I'm going to heaven because it said I was going. I don't care if everybody in Morgan and Zuck runs up and says, He's this, he's that, I don't like him, I don't like him. Don't matter one bit. I'm hell proof. Amen? I, that's right. <laughs> think about that. Hell proof. What do you think about that? You say, You think you're better? No, sir. I know I ain't. I know, I, I know what I deserve. I know where I ought to be, buddy. I ought to be in prison on my way to hell. But thanks God, thanks be unto God, I'm on my way to heaven because of Him. 
I read about old Billy Sunday. And old Billy Sunday was a great baseball player. They said he held the National League record of running the base. And he'd run barefoot. I don't know what happened when them cleats come down on him. Somebody tagged him out or something, but he'd run barefoot. And he held the record of somebody could run them first, second, third, all the way back home. And buddy, uh, uh, somebody up there in Chicago preached to him, and he got saved. He was making like, um, I think it was like $10,000 a year to play baseball, and that would be like 200000 now. And uh, Billy Sunday got saved and started preaching. And they couldn't believe it. They said, my goodness, what got into you? And son, old Billy Sunday won the great. Hey, you think I'm wild? Son, he took chairs. He took that yeah, and hung on each other. And uh, he'd take chairs like that. And boy, he'd break them, sling them down. And he said he'd wind up preaching on, on three rounds of his uh, breeches legs and his shirt tail hanging out. And sometimes his shirt be but tied, be laying off of He's a mess. By the time he got through preaching, brother, he looked like he'd been in a fight out in the back alley somewhere. I'm telling you, that old boy, they said he'd run back and forth across the platform like that. And he wrote his notes, his, lo- his preaching notes in big old letters like that. And somebody said, Preacher, why are you using big old notes? He said, so I'd read them when I run past the pit. I'm telling you, man, that old boy could preach. And they couldn't figure him out. They couldn't figure out what happened to him. And somebody said, all I know is that that's the reason for this birth that I'm preaching about. That grabbed men out of sin like Billy Sunday, like Mordecai Ham and precepts of him. And Mordecai Ham and them boys were preaching when Billy Graham got saved. And Billy Graham got saved. And he started preaching. And I got saved. And I started preaching. And this world can't figure us out. One man asked me one time, he said, what gives you the right to preach? I said, Lord, help me preach. He said, I mean, were you... Have you been to seminary? I said, no, sir. He said, have you been to Bible college? I said, no, sir. He said, well, what gives you the right to preach? I said, what gives them the right to tell who can preach and who can't? I preach because God told me to preach. The world cannot figure that out. They say, you must go through our program. You must be trained by us. You know, we are the... <laughs> God don't work that way. God will jerk an old boy up out of nowhere. He'll drag one out of a pool hall somewhere at 2 o'clock in the morning, save his soul, clean him up, put a King James Bible under his arm, and give him more brains than his teachers. And brother, help him to confound the mighty. That God will use somebody like that. That's why Jesus came into this world. To save our soul. That's the reason for it. It's not just so we can sing away in a manger and silent night. It's so we can rejoice. That souls are being saved and lives are being changed. Robert Murray McShane had a brother named David. And David got saved at a young age and prayed for his older brother, Robert. And he came in one day and he said, Is that necessary? The younger brother praying for him. And he finally uh, died. His brother David died. And Robert was 18 years old when his brother died. And the Spirit of God fell on him. And he got saved and started writing poems and shook Scotland, the whole nation of Scotland, by his poems and songs and stuff that he wrote. And he died when he was 30. I remember re- hearing about Corey Ten Boom, who her family, when the, when the Nazis invaded Holland, they come in and took her captive, you know, and put her in concentration camp. And so that woman went through hell on earth for months and months and months. Months and you remember how God used it, smuggled that Bible in there to her, and God answered her prayers and took it. That's why Jesus came to this earth. He's still working. He's not a little baby no more. He grew up literally three and a half years and never committed one sin. Keep your soul from hell. And he died a vicarious, atoning, substitutionary death on the cross in my place and yours. That's the birth. That changed this world. Skeptics may laugh at it. People may make fun of it. They can hide all they want to, but it's a historical and biblical fact that he was born and that he came into this world. You're hooked up with the right one this morning. I promise you. That's the birth that changed the world. The question I want to ask you this morning. The question I want to ask you this morning, if you had to die and face him today. Kids, Mamas and daddies, if you had to face the Lord today, 
Would it be well with your soul? Could you stand there and say, Lord, no, I've been saved. I'm, my faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Could you do that? I hope you could. If you've not, do like several did last Sunday morning. Walk down here this morning and say, you know what? I've heard that story about Jesus in that manger all my life, but I never knew it was all like that. I never knew it was just for me that He came. And I'm coming this morning, and I'm putting my faith and trust in Him. Let's stand with our heads bowed, please. Everyone stand.